How can I keep from singing your praise? As we completed Exodus 14, we saw the emotional escape from Egypt's bondage. Uh, with Pharaoh and uh, the chariots hot on their heels and water in front of them, undoubtedly the children of Israel uh, believed they were doomed to die. However, once again, in the midst of difficult and trying circumstances, the children of Israel saw firsthand the power of God. We're reminded of the fact that God doesn't always choose the easy path or the path of least resistance. But we see two things last week. First, God was always with them, always leading them. And secondly, God always has a plan, even when we don't see it or understand it. And I know for me, at least I learned four things from the message last week how we can respond as we go through difficult circumstances. Number one, we can fear the difficult circumstances. Just get afraid. Pretend that it's bigger than life. Pretend that we don't know how to deal with it. Pretend that it's just so overwhelming that God's just not big enough. And fear. Or we can run from it and pretend the difficult circumstance doesn't exist. Kind of the old proverbial ostrich sticking its head down in the sand and therefore can't see the things that are going on all around them. Or number three, we can gripe and complain about the difficult circumstance, which is the easiest thing to do. Or number four, we can embrace it with God's help. How did you do this past week? As God allowed some difficult circumstances in your life, how did you do? I wish I could say that I did great. Boy, everything that comes in that I didn't like, that I didn't choose, that I didn't you know, care for, just handled it perfect. Oh, I wish. As we look at Exodus 15 today, the title of one of Chris Tomlin's songs comes to mind. How can I keep from singing his praise? I'm still amazed every time I read through the book of Exodus, and I've read through it several times now, I'm amazed that over and over and over again, God, probably more so than, than any other time period in history, did miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Revealed His power, revealed His glory, and they just couldn't see it most of the time because they lived in the here and the now. And that's where we live. So much of what we do is revolving around the here and the now. Do you realize that, as I've reminded ourselves many times, reminded all of us, that God's Word says we're just pilgrims and sojourners and aliens and really our citizenship is where? In heaven. And anything that we can go through and experience and, and be a part of in this life is going to pass. James 4 says, what is your life? It is even as a vapor. Psalm says our life is but smoke. 2 Chronicles says our life is but a shadow that fades. Peter tells us that life is but grass that comes up and flowers that bloom and then fade away. Think about all these things that God's Word tells us about this life. And anything that we can experience, anything that we can touch, anything that we can go through is just temporary. Because God has a plan. I don't know what it says in many of uh, your Bibles on top of the chapter heading there in Exodus chapter 15. But depending on your Bible, it may say something like a song of praise. It may say something like Israel's song. How can we keep from singing His praise? If every one of us got what we truly deserved, it would be eternity in hell. But God in His love and His mercy and His grace gives us so much more. Amen? I want to read through Exodus chapter 15 and then we're just going to highlight several key things here. So if you would just follow along as I begin reading verse 1. 
Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. They said, I will sing to the Lord, for He is highly exalted. He has thrown the horse and its rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise Him. My Father's God. I will exalt Him. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is His name. He threw Pharaoh's chariots and his army into the sea. The elite of his officers were drowned in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They sank in the depths like a stone. Lord, your right hand is glorious in power. Lord, your right hand shattered the enemy. You overthrew your adversaries by your great majesty. You unleashed your burning wrath. It consumed them like stubble. The waters heaped up at the blast of your nostrils. The current stood from them like a dam. The watery depths congealed in the heart of the sea, the enemy said. I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire will be gratified at their expense. I will draw my sword. My hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. I love this verse 11. Lord, who is like you among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, performing wonders? Isn't that an awesome question? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. You will lead the people you have redeemed with your faithful love. You will guide them to your holy dwelling with your strength. As we look at these key verses, verse 1, verse 4, verse 5, verse 10, it's unbelievable the power that God has. And now we can somewhat understand why Moses and the Israelites sang to the Lord as they observed everything that God was doing. And he says with his very nostrils, he covers it and destroys every one of the enemies in just a single decision. And they have no other response but to sing his praise. Whenever God does something great and miraculous, he should be praised. Very often when God performs something great and miraculous, songs of praise and joy were sung in response to what He did. I want us to know several of these passages. In fact, in Job chapter 38, verse 7, if you would turn there. Job 38, and verse 7. Just before the book of Psalms there, Job 38, verse 7. It says, while the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Think about that. During creation, the morning stars sang and the angels shouted for joy at what God was doing. And you think, well, is creation that big a deal? Yes, it is. Because in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says that all mankind is without excuse because as he looks around him, he has to come to this conclusion. There must be a God who did all of this so that they are without excuse. And during creation, even the stars were singing and the angels shouted for joy. How about in Judges chapter 5? Go ahead and turn there just for a moment. I want to begin reading verse 1. Judges chapter 5, verse 1. It says, On that day, Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang. Why were they singing? Well, look what God was doing. When the leaders led in Israel, when the people volunteered, praise the Lord. Listen, kings, pay attention, princess. I will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you came then from Seir, when you marched from the fields of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured rain, the clouds poured water, the mountains melted before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. It goes on and just over everything that God is doing, they're singing out because of God's greatness. I mean, what else could they do but just to look at it? Look at verse 8. Israel chose new gods, then war was in the gates. Not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. And my heart is with leaders of Israel, with the volunteers of the people. Praise the Lord. You who ride on white donkey, who sit in the saddle blankets, and who travel on the road, give praise. 
Let them tell the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous deeds of his warriors in Israel, with voices of the singers in the watering places. Then the Lord's people went down into the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake. Sing aloud, aloud, arise, Barak, and take hold of your captive, son of Abinoam. The survivors came down to the nobles. The Lord's people came down to me with the warriors. Those with the roots of Amalek came from Ephraim and so forth. What were they doing? After everything that they did, they sat there and they sang and they rejoiced and they praised God because God is so powerful. Or in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 6 and 7, this is awesome. You remember the story quite well, I'm certain. 1 Samuel 18, this is the story where David goes out and kills Goliath. Look at verse 6 and 7. As David was returning from killing the Philistine, the women came out from all the cities of Israel to meet King Saul, singing and dancing with tambourines, with shouts of joy, and with three-stringed instruments. As they celebrated, the women sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. What were they doing? They were rejoicing because of what God had just done in destroying the Philistine giant. Anytime God does something great, He deserves to be praised. And in 2 Samuel chapter 22, we see another one. In verse 1, when David sang when he was delivered from the hand of his enemies. Every time God does something, we ought to say, praise the Lord. Because He's so awesome. In Isaiah chapter 51, verse 11, God's people sing, will sing as they enter Zion. Now think about this. One day we are going to be called home. Isn't that awesome? Some of y'all don't sound too thrilled about that. That is going to be awesome. It says we're going to be coming, marching into Zion, singing and bringing forth praise unto God. And we're going to realize just how temporary this life is and just how great and majestic God is. How about Mary in Luke chapter 1 when she proclaimed and praised the greatness of the Lord because now she was going to carry forth the newborn babe, the Christ child. Every time God does something great, He deserves to be praised. So often in this life, we live for the attaboy. Great job. Wonderful. But in essence, 1 Corinthians 4 asks the question, who maketh one to differ from another? Why... Do we praise man for what he has the ability to do when we know that God gave him the ability to do it? All praise and honor deserves to go to God. Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 106. Just a reminder here of what God was doing, what he was doing at work here. Psalm 106. Verse 1 says, Hallelujah. When's the last time you said that? Hallelujah. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Don Clark, I think there's a good song there somewhere. I think we've sung that. Who can declare the Lord's mighty acts or proclaim all the praise due Him? How happy are those who uphold justice, who practice righteousness at all times. Remember me, Lord, when you show favor to your people. Come to me with your salvation so that I may enjoy the prosperity of your chosen ones. Rejoice in the joy of your nation and boast about your heritage. Both we and our fathers have sinned. We have gone astray and have acted wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not grasp the significance of your wonderful works or remember your many acts of faithful love. Isn't that amazing? After seeing everything that God was doing there, as we said, who more saw the miracles of God more than the children of Israel? It says our fathers did not grasp it. They could not put their arms around what God was doing. It says instead they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. And even in their rebellion, what's it say here? Yet he saved them. Why? Because of his name, to make his power known. To re, he rebuked the Red Sea he, and dried it up and led them through the depths as through a desert. He saved them from the hand of the adversary. He redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Water covered their foes. Not one of them remained. Then they believed his promises and what? Sang his praises. 
How can we keep from singing His praise? If you would, take your Bibles and turn back to our text there in Exodus chapter 15. I'm amazed at this. This question, verse 11. Lord, who is like you among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, revered with praises, performing wonders? In Psalm chapter 55, it answers that question. I'm sorry, Psalm 135, excuse me. Psalm 135. It says, Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, you servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in our courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to His name, for it is delightful. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for Himself. Israel has He treasured as His, as his possession. For I know that the Lord is great. Our Lord is greater than all gods. The Lord does whatever He pleases in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in all the depths. Why can He do that? He's the sovereign God of the universe. He can do whatever He wants. He's God. Verse 7, He causes the clouds to rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain and brings the wind from His storehouses. He struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both people and animals. He sent signs and wonders against you, Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his officials. He struck down many nations and slaughtered mighty kings. Uh, Sion, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kings of Canaan. He gave their land as an inheritance, an inheritance to his people Israel. Lord, your name endures forever, your reputation, Lord, through all generations. For the Lord will judge his people and have compassion on his servants. But here's where he answers the question, verse 15. Who is like you, Lord? Verse 15, the idols of the nations are of silver and gold, made by human hands. They have mouths, but cannot speak. Eyes, but cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Indeed, there is no breath in their mouth. And those who make them are just like them, as are all who trust in them. And then a reminder, verse 19. To the house of Israel, to the house of Aaron, to the house of Levi, praise the Lord. And he says, verse 21, May the Lord be praised from Zion. He dwells in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. The Lord is to be praised. And as we think about it, it says, who is like thee? Think about this. I don't know if anyone in this building here today has any type of shrines in any part of your house. I doubt it. I doubt if any one of us has a little statue in a corner that we're bowing down to three, four, five, six, seven times a day. I don't know if any of us has any sounds like, uh, you know, the sounds of Mecca. Woo! You know, and everyone you know, got their carpet out. I don't, I don't think that's taken place. But can I ask this question? Are there idols? Yes. You know what an idol is? An idol is anything that we give more time, attention, and focus to than we do God. That has the potential of being an idol in our life. For some people, it's a hobby. For some people, it's a person. For some people, it's a job. For some people, it's laziness. But it says, who is like thee? There is no God that can compare to our real God. And he alone deserves to be praised. As we look at everything that God is doing here, over and over, they're reminded of this fact. There is none like you. Verse 12, you stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. Put your mind around that just for a moment. That they're walking on dry land and all of a sudden you just swallow them up as if they were never there. Just the water just unfolded over them. And not one of them was allowed to escape. In verse 14, why does he do what he do? does. When the peoples hear, they will shudder. Anguish will seize the inhabitants of Philistia. 
The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. Trembling will seize the leaders of Moab. The inhabitants of Canaan will panic. And terror and dread will follow on them. They will be as still as a stone because of your powerful arm until the Lord, your people, pass by. Lord, until the people whom you purchase pass by. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your possession. Lord, you have prepared the place for your dwelling. Lord, your hands have established the sanctuary. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Over and over. He says, why, why does he do, what he do what he does? What he does? is so that everyone can see that he is God. And we live in a world where people need to see that God is real. We live in a, in a place where everything else is exalted and God is diminished. Can we agree with what he says in John 3.31? He must increase and I must decrease. It is all about him. A second question is asked in Exodus 15, verse 17. What will you do? You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your possession. Lord, you have prepared a place for your dwelling. Lord, your hands have established a sanctuary. And the Lord, you will reign forever and ever. Who is like him? No one. What will he do? He'll reign forever and ever. And when I think about it, how can we keep from singing his praise? We have so much to be thankful for. I don't know about you, but I from time to time start complaining. I, I mean, I'm just speaking for myself, and I don't, I don't need any comments from the peanut gallery here, from those that live in my home. But I want everything just boom, 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 and, you know, perfect. Set it on the shelf to be taken off when I want it. Don't look at me strange. You're the same way. We like what we like. We put it on the shelf, and we want access to it anytime we want. And when we're done with it, we want to put it back on the shelf, and this little box called life just sits there nice and neat. And every once in a while... You're carrying stuff in and you bump the box and it falls on the floor. It's like, who dropped it? We don't want nobody to mess with our life. We want life perfect. Keep the dust off it, keep the cobwebs off it, just kind of just leave it alone, nice and pretty. Look at it. The problem is, once again, as we've learned over the last several weeks, is Here's expectation, here's reality. And sometimes the box of life gets bumped. Sometimes it gets dumped. But you think about it this perspective. Who gave you the life? Where does that life come from? Who filled that box with everything that's in it? God. So who has the right to do anything he wants with that life. Since he's the one that put him in there, Job says, the Lord give it, the Lord take the way, and what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. He's God. Our job, I think if we're honest with ourselves and what we can learn from Exodus 15, is to sing. Because he is great. To rejoice. Because he has done so much. And you know what the word, mean, the, the word praise means? It means literally to boast in God. We're good at boasting in our favorite team. Go Vikings. We're good at, yeah. We're good at boasting in what we want to take place and what we're excited about. But are we good at boasting in God? Why does he do what he does? So that everybody around can see him and how great he is. But when we gripe and complain about our box of life getting bumped, how does that affect those around us? I'm learning more and more that when I gripe about the box that I want nice and neat on the shelf and no dust, no cobwebs, just sitting nice and neat to be touched when I want it to be touched, when I gripe about it, it affects my kids. It affects my wife. It affects those around me. 
how dare somebody mess with my life? This is my life, my box, my shelf, leave it alone. And God says, wait a minute. Praise me. Rejoice in me. Because I gave that to you. They couldn't see all that God was doing. But God was with them, and he had a plan. And in the end, it's amazing how short the praising is. You see, God dealt with the Egyptians, and also, whoo, God's great. And then they griped at the Red Sea, and the chariots come behind, and then God did that, whoo, God's great. And then, who's God? And then we're going to see as God brings them through the desert of Mara, and then God provides the water. Oh, great God, water's here, God's great. And then back down, back forth, up, down, side to side. We forget what God has done. And he says, wait a minute, don't forget. This is why I've instructed you. You, you tell it with your kids, and you, you teach it so well that they can teach it to their kids, and they know it so well that they can. And the story goes on well, how great God is. We need to learn to sing, learn to praise and rejoice over what God has done. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity just for these few moments, Lord, to look at your word, to consider them, to, um, Lord, really just uh, contemplate your goodness.